And that's how I got my dad $500 million. Aww. Gosh, I never get tired of hearing that story. Well, duh, of course. Who doesn't love a good comeback story? Daddy, I can't wait until I get my comeback story. Ooh, I wonder what your streaming numbers are gonna be. Yeah, Disney, you never share those. Come on, give us a bow. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously, Disney. To be completely honest, we really thought your little guy wouldn't make it. I mean, to be the lowest opening in Pixar history? And out of nowhere beating Sony Spider-Man in the international market? Okay, you don't really have to mention that. It's unreal. Honestly, we didn't see it coming. Yeah, congratulations to you and Pixar. Speaking of which, where is he anyways? Oh, he's over at the far back corner of the restaurant. Hi, guys. Thanks for stopping by. Why is he there and not here? He's on timeout. I'm on timeout. And why is that? I did some stuff that I'm not proud of. Let's just say he did some very atrocious things to get people to notice Elemental. Honestly, I didn't think it was that big of a deal. What? Really? Did he commit fraud or something? Oh, no, no. Much, much worse. I mean, I don't think it was that bad, to be honest. I just thought maybe he, uh, more toys of him. he made he Claude the head of marketing. Ah. Ah. And kids like toys now, right? Speaking of kids, why are kids growing up? Why can't they, they just be like cartoons should, sometimes? Should you know? we be worried about him? Oh, yes. Yes, we should be very, very uh, worried about him. That was weird. We never, saw, we, we never thought of them being grown up. They were always kids. But Let's you know, for some reason, this keep him in the back for now. Oh my god, look, another sequel. <laughs> Elemental. We all know the story here. Released back in June of 2023, Elemental would be Pixar's 27th film and the second Pixar release to be showcased on the big screen post-pandemic, right after Lightyear. Oddly enough, only a day shy away from its anniversary. Initially known for its terrible box office debut, Elemental would find itself in headlines for its incredible $300 million comeback. That's right. After tanking domestically, Elemental would actually end up as a net good for Disney, earning a whopping $300 40 million dollars in the international market. Elemental would make up for this disappointing debut by raking in twice their budget. But what exactly is Elemental all about? Well, following a young fire element named Amber, we're taken along to an adventure as she and a water element named Wade navigate Element City together to find a way to save her parents' convenience store. But along the way, they will discover something far greater, their chemistry for one another. For short, Pixar made a romance movie about water falling in love with fire. And ooh, baby, they should have stayed in the drafts. Yeah. I didn't like the movie that much. To be fair, I don't think it was that bad either. By Pixar standards, it's okay. But again, it's not just as good as we've come to expect from Pixar. But at this point, I'm beginning to lose hope. I'm getting a wee bit concerned, Pixar, not gonna lie. But in all fairness, Elemental does show some remnants of classic Pixar at times. Unlike Lightyear, this movie, in some points, feels almost genuine. And I guess it's partly true because apparently the film was heavily inspired from the director's own life experiences growing up as an immigrant in New York City. And when watching the film, you can kinda see the heart that was put into it, but sadly for me, it does fall short. The story's all over the place. The third act is a complete pathetic excuse of a climax. The pacing is terrible. Oftentimes drags too much and oftentimes too quick to process. Fucking Claude. The characters aren't really that interesting either. And what's even more disappointing, the romance between our two leads is pretty weak. The last romance-focused movie I can recall from Pixar was Wally, -E, and that was between two robots that could not talk to one another, but yet they had better chemistry than little elements. Now, don't get me wrong, the movie does have its upsides. The animation looks great, but it's Pixar, so that's by default. Element City looks nice. It looks and feels genuinely lived in and not just a sorry ass excuse to have it added onto Disney World. Pixar pretty much set up systems around a lot of small particular details such as transportation, jobs, how some establishments cater to some other elements and stuff like that. And I like it. It's the little things that tends to impress me the most sometimes. I also really like the immigrant story arc they tried to do here. I think it was a mature topic that Pixar handled 
decently well. And though it does drag most of the time, give props to the film, they actually give the two leads a good chunk of the runtime to develop their relationship, even though it wasn't as good as they intended. Okay, sure, the movie isn't all that great. So how did it manage to get over $500 million after a terrible start? And don't say Claude, I will fucking Ban you. Unlike them, I took my time. I carefully calculated the trajectory of how the movie would perform, waited for the right moment, and judged the film after the masses have calmed down to avoid any recency bias. That is 100% what happened and not because Philippines took the movie out of rotation after just a week so I had to wait for it to come to Disney Plus only for me to be a lazy bastard and procrastinate for the entire month. Not a chance! Well anyways, we have a lot to talk about and I have a bunch of takeaways so why don't we just get right into it. What made Elemental incite such a massive turnaround? Was it because of word of mouth? The immigrant aspect? The marketing? Fucking Claude! Well, let's take a look. This is Disney and Pixar's Elemental. So the movie actually begins with our main character's parents arriving in Element City. Very original name, by the way. Took your sweet time coming up with that one, huh, Pixar? It's like naming New York City as Human City. It just doesn't sound right. We also get to see the different types of elements. You have fire. fire. Hey, no, no, banjo, banjo, go back to your room. Back, back, I say, back. You have fire, earth, water, and air. Whose mode of transportation looks a bit unsafe by the way. Like, what happens when you don't have a full flight? Is the blimp just gonna crash to the other elements down below? I am so sorry. A bunch of my friends had to cancel their flight last minute. I promise you, this type of thing does not happen. Oh, oh, you'll be fine, good sir. You're made of dirt. Just. Just go to the garden near gate 3 and shovel some gravel on your missing parts. You'll be fine. So yes, if you haven't pieced it together yet, this is where the immigrant aspect comes into play. And I really like this side of the movie. I like how they make it a point that fire people are immigrants here, right down to the language barrier, the mural inside the building, and of course, Element City not having the proper amenities to cater to elements such as Bernie and Cinder. Oh yeah, I almost forgot. This is Bernie and Cinder Lumen, our main character's parents. And how do we spell that? God damn! Jeez, okay! No, slow down! Okay! Shit! <coughs> the two would manage to buy a spot just at the outskirts of Element City, and it turns out Cinder was pregnant, and later on we get to meet our main character, their daughter, Amber. <gasps> <laughs> You're laughing? I technically died for a second. All I saw was darkness and pain, and you're laughing? So for the next three minutes, we get to see both Amber and the fire community grow. We even get introduced to the blue flame, which somehow becomes very important later in the movie, so let's put a pin on that. And I do gotta say, so far so good. This whole opening sequence is just about seven minutes long, and it was delivered and paced pretty well. We got a good shot of Element City, a nice quick introduction to Amber and her parents, and overall we got to see how both their shop and their community came to be. I like it. I like how slow and delicate this movie is trying to be with this particular sequence. Ugh. I feel like I've been too nice to this movie so far. Quick, say something bad. The fire animation does not look good at first glance. Don't get me wrong, it does get better as the movie goes on. It just takes some time getting used to it. I don't know why, but it kind of looks weird and cheap at first compared to what the other elements look like. I mean, I admire the direction they went here, make no mistake, but god, tell me that doesn't look wonky for ya. You move like you're from a game that was made for the PS3. Grab some updates. Fast forward to a couple of years later and we finally get to see a fully grown 22 year old Amber manning the shop. Ooh, the sparklers are buy one get one free? That's right. But I just want the free one. Sorry, that's not how this works. Nope. Nope, nope, give me one for free! That's not how this works! Calm, calm. Sometimes customer can be tough. Unfortunately, that customer wasn't being tough. He was just being a complete dumbass. But you know what? It's fine. Seriously though, dude. What the fuck is wrong with you? Turns out, Amber has quite the temper as she easily explodes whenever she feels irritated by a customer. And as someone who used to work in retail, that is every day. She almost went full purple! I've never seen anyone go full purple. I'm getting real sick of your shit, Denise. Oh yeah, remember Cinder, the mom? Well, turns out that she's a love expert now. Her little shtick from here on out is that she can sense if a couple is in love by... 
sniffing them. Yeah, she spends most of the movie sniffing our main characters and that's pretty much all she does. No, literally. Cinder is pretty much just there to spoon feed the viewers about what's happening. I shit you not. Her biggest moment in the movie is to literally tell the audience that our two main characters, who were already dating by the way, are in love. Do you really think your viewers were that fucking dumb, huh, movie? Yep, nothing. Just a loveless, sad future of sadness. Disney, we gotta talk about you not knowing what to do when both parents of the main character are alive. I feel like it's a problem that we just haven't acknowledged yet. Merry fire. Ugh. Beautiful. Yeah, so apparently Amber is so tight-knit with her career that her mother is beginning to worry that she won't be finding true love anytime soon. Which is one of the most unrealistic things here in the movie about water falling in love with fire. You mean to tell me that an Asian parent is worried that her daughter is too focused on her job rather than a love life? That's a lie. So off Amber goes to deliver the packages and... Yo, yo, yo! Oh my god. This is Claude, a young earth element who has the hots for Amber. You probably recognize him because he was in front of basically every fucking poster. I kid you not. For some reason, Pixar really wanted to push this movie with all four elements in mind. Marketing pretty much all fire, water, earth, and air characters, no matter how minute the role they had. And no one else represents it better than this fuckface. Bro got a whopping two minutes screen time and he he got all this promotion. He got all this shit. How the fuck did you get a solo poster? That's a pretty big deal. It'd take an act of God to get me across that bridge. An act of God or an act of Claude? Oh my fucking god. Later that day, Amber would successfully break the record which leads to her dad putting her in charge of the big red dot sale coming up the next day, giving her the chance to prove to him that she's ready to take over the shop. On the next day however, the customers would prove to be too much for Amber and she scrambles down to the basement just to explode. Unfortunately, the outburst causes the pipes to leak, introducing us to our second main character, Wade. I'm gonna have to write you a ticket. Got sucked in. Oh. Well, permit? Uh. I'm gonna have to write that up too. First, I'm sucked into. Oh my god. Name an even worse introduction for your main character. Holy shit, Pixar. What the fuck is this? I'm sorry, but oh my god, Wade, you are so fucking annoying. Talk about a terrible first impression. Dude, you've only been on screen for a solid minute and you've done nothing but fucking cry. It's weird. I don't know what Pixar was trying to do here. Never in my life did I ever witness such a terrible handling of an introduction for a character. There was about a million different ways they could have gone about it but they chose the weirdest route. I don't know how to explain it but Wade gives off major side character vibes. The constant over the top crying was already bad enough but but then he actually turns out to be a city inspector and immediately writes up Amber and her family's shop. I'm a city inspector and this pipe is definitely not up to code. You fucking nerd. And you know what's worse? He actually gathers enough evidence to get the place shut down. And he delivers it in the most exasperated way possible. First I'm sucked into a pipe and I have the right citations I can get this place shut down. Oh gosh, it's just too much. Oh my god, I fucking hate you. So here's what happens. Amber actually begs for Wade to calm down and let her explain everything. No shop needs to be shut down and nobody needs to get hurt. All they need is to talk. And just like any sane person with even an ounce of empathy, you know what he does? He fucking runs away. Yeah, so our little lovable, charming, and soft-hearted lead shows up to someone's basement unannounced, floods that said person's basement, writes up a family's business for City Hall, gets the other lead's business shut down, and runs away from a rational conversation. Weed Ripple, everybody! Your main character's love interest. The bar is in hell. We get a whole chase sequence as well, and it's equally as frustrating as you thought it'd be. What are you fucking doing? The pad is made of paper, just fucking burn it! We've seen you burn shit on the spot before, you couldn't do that now! 
Wade would get away though and successfully submit his report to City Hall. And I'll just have to warn you, what happens next if you're even already slightly annoyed with Wade at this point? What he's about to say in the next scene will completely make his character irredeemable for you. For the rest of the movie, you will have a constant hate and annoyance with this character. I guarantee. T. Wade would overhear Amber's plea to basically herself at this point, and again, this is a warning. Watch what happens. If I'm the reason he gets shut down. It will kill him. Oh, he will never trust me to take over. Why didn't you say that before? What? Bitch, I tried to. What the fuck? What did you think? You think I just like chasing people off the fucking streets? Do you think I just do this shit on the regular during my spare time every fucking Tuesday morning? You trespassed on my family's property and threatened to close us down. I begged for a chance to explain and you fucking ran away. Why did I say so before? Why did I say so before? Connect the fucking dots, Wade. Connect the fucking dots. The absolute fucking goal to tell Amber that she should have just said so when she literally tried to say so is fucking crazy. You're telling me I'm gonna have to watch Amber fall in love with you? You asshat? No, oh, get me out of here. Get me out of here. I can't. I can't. Let me watch something else. No, oh, I'm staying here. Now here's a weird scene. Amber comes home to help with the flooded basement and seemingly out of nowhere, Bernie and Cinder kinda just randomly share why they left their homeland. And let me tell you, it's a pretty weird story. It was hard living. We put everything into it. But then a great storm came. come from? What was that? Was that a common occurrence? If so, why was your house so weak against it? And how come it looked like it was only your home that got destroyed? Everyone else looked fine? Why was Bernie's family disappointed with them leaving? Like, did you just not see what happened to their home? Are none of you gonna help out here? Fuck, Cinder was pregnant and she had to sleep on the floor on top of the wreckage. Did none of you even try to offer a place for them to stay for the night? Now I know it's a bit unfair for me to be a bit nitpicky over a 30 second long flashback, but this scene here felt a bit too forced. The storm coming out of nowhere doesn't really make sense, let alone it's solely destroying the Lumen shop and nothing else. This felt like this should have been part of the film's intro. I think it would have flowed well if you just added in the quote backstory together with the sequence at the beginning of the movie. And how about instead of it being a random storm, why not just have the Lumens genuinely struggle in their homeland? I don't know, maybe have their shop do terrible. Maybe Bernie wants to find better opportunities somewhere else. Hell, you could even have the storm but let it be a reoccurring thing that would drive the Lumens away from Fireland. Have some heavy emotional conflicts to justify them leaving, you know? But no, we get this forced flashback instead. Side note, one of the only things these flashbacks bring of value was the big bow but again you could have easily just added it in in the beginning of the movie anyway so well back to the movie following the next day our two leads meet up once again hey hey oh, sorry you're so hot excuse me no i mean like you're smoking no i didn't mean oh like good lord bro grammatically you're so hot doesn't even make sense in this context wade what are you trying to be a creep Fucking dumbass. Well, I just came by because I left my passes for the game here last night. Passes? Like, plural? Well, what a coincidence. Why do you have multiple passes, Wade? Who are you going to bring? And why did you abandon them for some plain pussy? We then get to meet Wade's boss. Gail. Fun fact, I actually had to google Gail's name because the movie does a terrible job delivering it and like a cruel joke, the actual D23 website misspelled her name in one of their sentences. This is some sort of sick, brutal foreshadowing for the movie, isn't it? We love you lots! Up, you failed to murder her that time, Wade. So it turns out there's a leak within the city which leads to Amber and Wade come with an agreement with Gale that if they find the leak and get it fixed, the tickets will be voided and the Loomis will get to keep their shop. To add some context, apparently water was closed off in Firetown for it being, you know, Firetown. Does it really explain why they took away water for the convenience of the fire people when there's a giant ass train that causes a tsunami from above whenever it crosses the bridge that could kill fire people? But you know what? I don't give a shit. And they reveal the cause of why the water is back up and running. But then I heard this explosion. Ah! That's how 
how I ended up at your place. Oh, Flame! My temper caused this! Fucking what? Your temper didn't do shit? What do you mean? I thought the government shot off the water in the pipes. Why was the only thing that was blocking it off was a clog made of dirt? Don't they have a valve or something? I'm sorry. I'm no engineer. I don't know how pipes work. But I'm pretty sure professionals would have some sort of system that would barricade water from going through a certain pipe, no? Those canals go everywhere. That's why tracking down that leak has been so dang hard. The roof. Up oh, and they're on the roof. <laughs> Top tier editing there. Which one of you editors fucked up that transition? Hmm. What? There's only one editor? Well, that just makes it sad. <laughs> Nothing weird going on here. Uh, just a little pruning. <laughs> <laughs> No, 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 no. You are not giving us this cliche of a scene. You can't just shove them together alone in a hot air balloon and have them romantically stare at each other and expect us to go along with it. You two have not earned this moment yet, mind you. I barely know you as a character. I'm given no context on why a civilian is doing city maintenance. I fucking hate you. So what the hell are we doing here? We just came fresh from a pruning joke. Like... Bro, this was pretty much the first time they got to calmly talk to one another and now you're telling me that they're sharing love stares now? To the movie's credit, they do actually start to flesh out both characters during their hot air balloon ride. <laughs> What's funny about all this is that we actually got a decent amount of depth out of them. We get to know more about Amber and her struggles being a fire element and we also get a good and better look at Wade and his personality. So I missed my one chance to see a Bibisteria. You must have been so scared. Yeah, okay, that's pretty good character development, whatever. Well, anyways, the two would finally find the source of the leaks, and it turns out it was all because of, drumroll please, a hole. Yeah, it doesn't really take a detective to draw that conclusion, but hey. What do you mean help? You're made of water. You literally went through this shit already. Didn't they already establish that this shit doesn't really kill you? She's made of fucking fire. What do you want her to do? Jump in? The two would eventually manage to temporarily fix the hole with bags of sand. And kinda just out of nowhere, Wade asks Amber out on a date. In which she never verbally agrees from, by the way. I have rewatched this thing three to four times now and she does not say yes on this date. But yet, for some reason... Here we are. Also, Amber, when Wade said the date starts at 3, I think that meant you have to be there before 3. And so the next couple of minutes is spent on a pretty lengthy montage of Amber and Wade dating. And I'm not gonna lie, I like it a lot. The montage is around 5 minutes long and I personally think it's one of the few enjoyable things in here. The two share a pretty good chunk of development and the scenes are pretty cute. And to be completely honest, I actually really dig the song they play too. I know it's such a generic Gen Z pop love song but god damn it it actually works well with the movie for some reason. It's hilarious. Well anyways, later in the movie, in a complete shocker, turns out the temporarily fixed leak didn't hold and the lumen shop is in trouble once again. Now here's a scene that I don't get. Wade would sneak over to the store to tell Amber about the leak but her father would catch him red handed. We get a little gag of Wade pretending to be a food inspector and get absolutely obliterated by the hot food which ultimately gets him banned. But he didn't really have to do all that though. He came to the store in his city inspector uniform and I have no idea why both Wade and Amber were trying to hide that fact. Instead, he ends up lying about being a food inspector. But bro, you could have easily told Bernie about the leak. Hell, Bernie brings it up immediately. Why are you poking around? Is this because of water leak? No. Yes, yes because of water leak. What do you mean? This would have been the perfect time to tell your dad that his shop was in fucking trouble. You kept this a secret from Bernie the first time because you didn't know Wade. But now, you two are literally dating. Wade could just straight up tell your dad about the leaks and just not mention it being your fault. Even though it isn't. Right? Am I missing something? Why is the leak still Amber's responsibility? Why is it somehow still her fault? I don't get it. If the city officials themselves confirmed that they shut off water from Firetown, how is it Amber's fault that water somehow made it back in? Hell, if anything, Wade is as much to blame on the water leak as well. He's the one that pushed the clog out the pipes. I just don't get the scenario why they're keeping this whole thing a secret. You've talked to Gail, you've reached an agreement. All you have to do now is to hold up your end of the 
bargain, which is to fix the leak. Don't you think having more manpower and more public outcry would convince the city to go and fix it? This movie has such a solvable problem and they're doing everything they can to just not do shit. Amber and Wade managed to fix the leak once again. But this time, Amber would use her glass crafting skills to create a giant tempered glass wall. Later on, as they wait for Gail's approval, Amber would be invited up to Wade's home and have dinner with his family. And a lot happens here. I actually think this is the moment the movie actually starts to get interesting. An hour into its runtime. Perfect execution, Pixar. Just mwah. Now. I don't really know how to transition to this one, so I'll just go ahead and say it. After dinner, Wade's family would decide to play the crying game. Ooh, thought bubble. That came from your ass, my dude. Whatever that thought was, no. Nah, but seriously, they actually end up playing this crying game, where if you get your opponent to cry, you earn a point. Amber gets pitted against Wade and... Let me tell ya. If at this point, you're not even remotely annoyed by Wade, what he's about to do might change your mind. But if you already do hate Wade, well, he's about to drive you off the fucking edge. Ready, go. Butterfly, windshield wipers. An old man on his deathbed remembers the summer he fell in love. He let her go thinking surely summer would come again. Almost out of time. Ember, when I met you, I thought I was drowning. That light inside you has made me feel so alive. And all I want now is to be near it. Near you. Dude. Fuck you, man. You fucking dick. How dare you tell her all that just to earn a fucking point. You manipulative piece of shit. I can't be the only one who felt this way on the first viewing. That is diabolical. Wade actually starts to give a whole heartfelt speech to Amber about how much he loves her. But he doesn't do it because he felt it was the right time to say it. He does it to force a tear out of her. You fucking dick. If I was Amber and this happened to me in real life, I'd be fucking pissed. Okay, look. This was probably Pixar's half-ass way of telling the audience that Wade has fallen deeply in love with her. But you gotta read the context, my guy. You're playing a game where you have to make your opponent cry. This was not the right moment to say this for the first time. This just feels so sleazy and cheap from Wade instead of it being genuine and authentic. What a completely missed mark by Pixar. You were just randomly spouting out sad shit to make her cry. And the moment you're about to lose, you decide to throw that speech right at her just to win a game? Fuck you, Wade. Fuck you. Glass! You repaired it with glass? Tempered glass! Solid as a rock, I like it. You're okaying this? It was supposed to be a temporary fix! Get your men and actually fix the goddamn thing! With your tickets now voided, the fireplace doesn't have to shut down. The movie's almost over, bear with me. <laughs> what the fuck? One of the significant things about this part of the movie is that this is the first time the film opens up about Amber and her special talent in crafting melted glass. Yeah. Remember all those times she was making glass and all that shit throughout the entire movie? Well, apparently it's a special talent. I don't know, I just assumed that every fire element could do that, but apparently not. It's probably because the movie does a terrible job conveying that Amber actually likes crafting melted glass. She never shows any interest in it. She only does it when she has to fix something, which kind Kinda leads you to assume that she only does it through obligation and there was really no indication that this was a passion of hers. For a movie that's been spoon feeding us information for almost an hour, I think this was a crucial plot device that we needed to know. Well anyways, turns out Wade's family is very heavy on art and Wade's mom actually offers Amber a job at a glass making firm. And the moment this idea is introduced, the movie immediately starts to pick up its pace. Yeah, it's been a bit of a drag up to this point. An hour into the movie and only now are we getting a conversation about Amber's true feelings about running the shop. Turns out, she doesn't want to run the shop. I don't think I actually do want to run the shop. That's what my temper has been trying to tell me. No, I think it's because you have a bad temper problem, but you know what? Because the only way to repay a sacrifice so big is by sacrificing your life too. That's right, baby! We're talking about generational trauma again! Woohoo! 
We can only punch the same hole in your bingo card so many times, Disney. You gotta start thinking of something else. Cinder would find out about the two by sniffing like a weirdo, of course. She does a reading and she confirms that they're both in love. This is twice that Pixar had to blatantly tell us that these two are in love. What's up with that? After a pretty good looking underwater scene, the two discover that elements can in fact mix and that they can touch each other without actually killing one another. They share an intimate moment, but this gets cut short as the two get into an argument about Amber's future. This would lead to Amber actually calling it quits between them and accept her dad's offer to run the shop. And I'm just gonna say, I really like the direction Pixar was trying to go here keyword being trying. It's a very mature conflict that's being brought up and it's a conflict that 90% of the time our characters are just talking through it like actual people. What I like most about all this is how they present it. No monster, no evil storm, no big bad corporate man to ruin the day. It's literally just Wade and Amber arguing about how drastically different of an impact to their lives their choices make. One is rich and has nothing to lose while the other pretty much carries the burden of honoring her family's legacy even if it means sacrificing her own. The movie does a great job slowing down here and actually let the characters explore this problem by themselves. And I really like it. I like the storyline. I like the vision, the concept. It's heavy, relatable, mature, and it heavily relies on both the characters' depth and development. Too bad we don't get much more of that because we got a flood to stop. Whee! Yeah, so, shocker, the glass wall doesn't hold which leads to a massive flood breaking out in the entirety of Element City. Well, who would have seen that? Coming. And... <sighs> Yeah, this fucking flood, man. This thing just ruins everything. Not only has this leak, flood, or whatever the fuck you call it, become so tedious, it's consistently caused the pacing to go in a complete standstill. I don't care about the flood. You were doing just fine earlier. You didn't have to bring in a whole force of nature to fix shit. This thing has been an overarching story for the entire movie, and I don't care about what it does. The flood is basically the big climax of the movie, and... What I don't like about this is that it magically forces to fix everything. It forces Amber to get stuck in the shop. It brings Wade back to save her. And because he saved her, it gets the approval from her father, allowing her to get the internship out of town. It's all a domino effect that happens in one sitting. It's so disappointing. You built up all this, all the rushed plot lines, all the character growth, only for all of it to get solved with a flood? What is this, Noah's Ark? Wade and Amber would get trapped inside the store because they had to save the blue flame. I remember that. Trapped inside a confined space together, the two lovers are faced with a difficult dilemma. Save Wade and let Amber and the blue flame fizzle out or keep Amber safe by letting Wade evaporate from the intense heat. That's right kids, our main characters are talking about which one of them will have to die. <laughs> Ultimately, Wade will sacrifice himself to save Amber and the Blue Flame. And I kid you not, he legit, and I cannot make this up, dies in front of Amber. Yup. It's as fucked up as you think it is. In their perspective, Amber literally got trapped in a room with another person, witnessed him die, and had to sit there for God knows how long before getting rescued. It is horrifically traumatic as shit. So with all that, Amber and the Blue Flame are safe, and Wade dies. I loved him, Dad. <laughs> but of course, with some Disney bullshit, turns out Wade is still alive. Because condensation's a thing, you know, where evaporated water can still turn back into liquid because the water vapor loses heat energy. And you know what? I'm not smart enough to talk about this and explain this to you. Wade is alive because of science, okay? Okay. Oh, something's happening. Oh, creepy. Oh, that's fucked up. Ah! Oh, what the five nights of... Freddy bullshit was that? With Wade all okay, and with a stab of approval from the Lumens, we finally get to see our two lovers big kiss. One time jump later, and we see Wade accompanying Amber to sail off for her internship. And here's a pretty nice scene. As the ending shot, Amber would give her father the big bow, in which he would bow back. Not only does it show the highest form of respect between the two, but this would also show that once and for all, in one way or another, that Amber is indeed ready. But the end credit song is still pretty fire though. So that was Disney and Pixar's Elemental. Yeah, Pixar is going to be doing sequels from now on, aren't they? 
Don't get me wrong. The movie does have its upsides. Like I said, the animation looks great. The voice acting is pretty good. Wade and Amber shared a lot of cute scenes together. And the immigrant story arc was handled decently well. They could have presented the story in a million different over-the-top ways. And I'm glad it didn't go that route and just kept it simple. And like it or not, the movie does have heart. But overall, everything else is just a mess. The story was all over the place. The pacing is terrible. Fucking Claude. The romance didn't really work. And the main characters, ironically, doesn't have much chemistry. For an hour and 30 minutes, the movie fails to get me invested in both Amber and Wade as a couple. If your love story is so uninteresting and so uninvesting that you actually have to spoon feed us what the characters feel and how we should feel, then you failed on how to tell a story. The characters are completely forgettable and lazily written too. Wade is such an annoying character. He's uninteresting, he's hard to root for, and he's just plain bland. He is what I can describe as the definition of tap water. Just nothing. Diarrhea if you're not so lucky. Overall, there's a lot going on with this movie. Maybe a bit too much for Pixar to handle. It has its moments, but in the end of the day, this movie is just not that well executed. The heart is there, but the delivery just falls flat. This isn't Pixar's worst, mind you. But to be honest, I don't think Pixar could ever do worse than this. This isn't really that bad, but I can also argue that this movie isn't really that good either. As a movie in general, it's good. But as a Pixar film, it's just slightly passable. So that's why I'm giving Elemental a 5 out of 10. That's for today's video. I hope you enjoyed your stay. Have a great day and a great life. And I'll see you all next time. Bye. I do gotta say this though, thank god Elemental made money. I was so certain that after the terrible opening week, Disney and Pixar would practically wave the white flag and kill original ideas altogether. So with this movie making nearly 500 million, it's safe to say we won't be seeing forced cash grab sequels anytime soon. Oh son of a bitch!